welcome everybody. I know some of you will still be logging in, but we are glad to have you with us tonight for a very important conversation. Digital balance and well-being, a conversation with digital media experts. We are delighted to have with us tonight a panel of really extraordinary people in the field of digital media and counseling. So we are expecting a really great night of conversation and also plenty of time for questions. So again, I am the founder of the Parent Education Series, a program I started 15 years ago to provide voice to parents and education, particularly for public school parents. I'm also co-founder of the nonprofit, The Parent Venture. Again, very happy to have you with us here tonight. We, if you need Spanish interpretation, we have Cynthia Henestrosa with us to offer simultaneous Spanish. You can click on the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then the globe that says Spanish. So Cynthia, thank you in advance for your interpretation. Um, special thanks to Jack West and Javier Gutierrez, who are leaders of the Sequoia Union High School District Digital Wellbeing Task Force. You'll be hearing more about that from Jack tonight, but a special thank you to Jack and Javier for your leadership. We also want to thank our sponsors, the Sequoia High School Education Foundation, the Sequoia Union High School District, Peninsula Healthcare District, Sequoia Healthcare District, and the Parent Venture without whose sponsorship, this program would not be possible. So today, what we're going to do is start out by hearing from our panelists. So each of them will tell you a little bit about themselves and the work that they're doing with students and patients and clients. And then we're gonna open it up to questions from you, the audience. In the chat, please feel free to chat to one another, ask us questions, share links. My partner, Bev Hartman, will be putting in links that are relevant to today's conversation but we ask that you put questions in the Q&A button. If you could keep them kind of brief and general, we wanna to get to as many of your questions as we can. Um, before I tell you a little bit about who our panel is tonight, I also want to say that this event is being recorded and will be available on our video library. That is a free resource, Bev will post the link with over 14,000 video views this year. We know that we're reaching a lot of parents and we thank you again, panelists for making this webinar possible and agreeing to be on our video library. Our next event is Thursday, celebrating Heart Health Month, COVID-19 implication for heart health, hosted by Sequoia Healthcare District. That is a town hall meeting, free and open to the community, 6 p.m. on Thursday, February 25th. Alrighty, let me tell you a little bit who we have with us tonight. Elaine Desu. hi Elaine. Elaine is a mental health support specialist at Woodside High School, joining us tonight. We have also Dr. Dan Friedman. He's a licensed clinical psychologist in the child and adolescent team at Kaiser Permanente Redwood City. Jamie Nunez is the Bay Area Regional Director for Common Sense Media. Thank you, Jamie. And last but definitely not least is Jack West, who's an educator at Sequoia High School and also the coordinator of the Digital Balance and Wellbeing Task Force. So to get us started tonight, again, I'd like each of you to tell us just a little bit about yourself what brought you to this work and what you're seeing with your students or with your patients or with your clients. Jack, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Charlene. <clears throat> and thank you for your leadership in our community in parent education. Uh, thank you for your participation as a digital well-being task force member. And for the audience members who don't already know this, a typical year would be 15 to 20 events, it sounds like, for the parent education series. And it's already been 80 of these online events this during this COVID time, which I think is both fantastic and impressive. Charlene already mentioned the thank yous to uh, Sequoia Union High School District and to Javier Gutierrez, who is the administrator in charge of the Digital Wellbeing Task Force that I chair. And so I wanted to make double mention of that because I work closely with Javier in making sure that we're doing the good work that we want to do. <clears throat> Kaiser Permanente is also sponsoring this digital well-being task force work. Stacy Wagner is here and uh, as an observer and as a parent and also as a participant on the digital well-being task force. Dr. Doug Balsters from the pediatrics at Kaiser is on our task force and acts as a consultant for us. And as um, Charlene mentioned, Dan Friedman is here with us tonight as a panelist. So Kaiser has played a big role in shaping this work and they're uh, a partner at every level. We are so thankful to them for that. Common Sense Media and Jamie in particular has been both uh, um, 
a leader and a friend to me in this work. I, I, we couldn't be doing it without common sense right there by our side. And so big thanks to, to those guys. The Sequoia Healthcare District is also a sponsor for this work. And I don't know if Karen Lee is here tonight, but she's been helpful in shaping our direction as well. Of course, perhaps uh, most importantly, the 45 task force members who represent are, are representative of students and teachers, school leaders from five different districts in our Southern Peninsula region here in San Mateo County, as well as business leaders like Charlene, uh, all participating on a monthly basis or a semi-monthly basis to help shape the movement of this task force, which I should tell you a little bit more in a moment, but I think I'll start by telling a chronological story uh, to introduce myself. I am a teacher at Sequoia High School and I started there in 1998. Uh, took a break in 2011 and joined the tech world. That took me to New Zealand. I worked for a New Zealand based ed tech company and I traveled the world. I went uh, frequently to Europe and to Canada and to both Australia and, and New Zealand. So all the uh, Commonwealth countries, and I got to see schools up close. I was working in both implementation and in marketing and sales because it was a startup, so I got to see the full breadth of an organization as well as the schools that we were serving, a lot of them innovative. That work came to a close for me and started to wrap up around 2017. My, I contracted back again with the Sequoia Union High School District on some technology implementations, and in 2018 had an opportunity to return as a teacher as my own son entered into high school. So I've come full circle back around. At that time, the district asked me to co-lead the rewriting of the district technology plan. This was something that we used to do every three years, but for whatever reason, it had laid fallow for about five or six years and it really needed an update. So we engaged approximately 60 or 70 different stakeholders, not unlike the Digital Wellbeing Task Force over the course of the year, this is 2018, and uh, examined everything from the backbone of our technology internet all the way to where it meets the students and the teachers on the other sides of screens in the classrooms and at home. And there were three major outcomes from that investigation that were top priorities. One was that we wanted to double down on the existing systems that we had in the high school district, Google Apps for Education and Canvas in particular. Thank goodness we did. Think about the timing there. Uh, that was 2018. Uh, second was to have greater and deeper and embedded professional development to support that and to integrate with all of the professional development so that it wouldn't be necessarily technology professional development and education curriculum instruction. PD, it would be those two together and they'd be integrated. And so that has already, that work has already begun. And third, <clears throat> and the reason why we're here tonight was a, a really loud chorus of voices, I would say most strongly from the parent community and from the vice principals of all of the schools that we re needed to really examine what was going on with screen time. So that was what we were calling at that time, was screen time. What were the impacts of screen time? So that spring, after we delivered the report to the Board of Education and they approved it along with budget, I, I proposed that we kick off another year of investigation, if not more, and now it's going to be more, uh, looking into that screen time issues. That same spring, Common Sense Media offered a conference that they hosted at the Mountain View Computer History Museum, I, I believe it was, and they called it, I, I believe it was titled Digital Wellbeing. So I thought, oh, I'll just change the title from screen time to digital well-being, and then we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Because I think that's a better, a softer title. It, it's more encompassing. And, uh, and so we ran with that. The Superintendent's Council approved that work. We found some funding for it. As I mentioned to you before, you know our sponsors now. And uh, we needed to set some goals. So we gathered an initial group of people. We said, hey, what is it that we really want to look at with this digital well-being task force? And so uh, we came up with three things. One is we want to we want to work not just within the high school district, because for some strange reason, California 
has school districts that are nine through 12 separate from their K through eight, but we wanna do this in concert with our feeder districts of which I believe there are seven and there are five of whom that we've been working with closely to integrate digital citizenship curriculum K through 12 so that we know what the kids are getting when they're doing it and, and we have it happening at the appropriate times. Two, we would look at existing practices and the research to advise our school leaders on technology use policies. So each of the schools has an acceptable use policy for the students and then we have other technology policies that are informed by law, of course, like COPA and PIPA and, and all the other emerging laws, but also are really about practice. And then third, uh, as we got deeper into the work, community education and parent education in particular. So this is our first venture into that third of those goals as uh, we bring this panel to you. So uh, I think that's it, except for one last thing that I'd like to share with you. And I'm gonna share my screen to do that. And it is a working definition of what we mean by digital well-being. So hopefully, you are able to see this. Do you see what is digital well-being? Excellent. I'll read it to you. And then Charlene, you can grab the hook and pull me off the stage. Uh, the active practice of thinking critically about the emotional, mental, social, and physical impacts of our time online. To engage in digital well-being practice, we work to identify and respond to the physical and psychological impacts from the way we share and receive information on any digital device. So this falls uh, in the middle of digital citizenship. So digital citizenship, if you look at the International St Standards for Technology and Education, uh, is, includes about nine or 10 different things like, I have a list somewhere here, like uh, rights and responsibilities and law and access and security and cybersecurity and commerce. But when we're talking about digital well-being, we're talking about a subset of those things, the health and wellness component of digital citizenship. And that's all I got for my intro. Thank you, Charlene. All right, thank you, Jack. That is a beautiful definition. I loved hearing a little bit more about your background and the journey that brought you here. Wow. So Elaine, if you could spend a couple of minutes telling us about you and what you're seeing with your students at Woodside. Definitely. Thank you. And thank you for including me in this important conversation. I began um, my journey as a school counselor, got my master's degree in counseling and was trained as a marriage family therapist um, and spent my first 12 years in my career as a school counselor. And um, two years ago, Sequoia Union High School District decided to invest, um, and rightfully so, um, some funding to create the mental health support specialist positions at each of our sites. And so what I've seen in 2006, um, that I believe is when Facebook started. So, um, you know, at the time, MySpace was the thing. And uh, social media was not so prevalent in our lives yet, nor was smartphones, right? And as my career progressed and I worked with adolescents, we saw the increase of mental health needs. Um, and working at Fremont at the time, at the beginning of my career, at a pretty similar size school, uh, the mental health need uh, was not so great at the time. I began my work at uh, Woodside High School in 2009 and I saw the increase unfold. Um, and as we depended more and more on technology, um, the increase of anxiety, depression, eating disorders, uh, we saw in our department increase in the, the need for accommodations and support at the school level. Um, so in my time and what we're seeing and this is such an important conversation, um, is the, the need to address digital citizenship and how it impacts the mental health needs of our students, uh, because it's really trickling into their lives, socially, academically. And um, I 
think that this conversation, as we do focus on the conversation about COVID and how it's impacted us, just understanding and acknowledging that we had seen, seen an increase prior to COVID happening. You know, there, there were a lot of students that we were referring to um, Dr. Friedman's field here. Uh, so here we are um, two years in and looking at um, the data in comparison to last year, if we look at fall semester of 2019, um, the number of students accessing uh, therapy or uh, school-based counseling hasn't increased since, uh, hasn't increased uh, this year, but mind you, we're doing everything telehealth. So the numbers um, are just changed from, had just changed from about 300 students accessing services to about 200 this current school year. And I think that's significant because the students don't have a physical office or center to walk into. These are students that are reaching out because they need it um, and they need the support. And so while it's a little less, um, we know that the students' needs are greater and the amount of students that need intensive care has increased. Um, so uh, I really appreciate um, the work that we're doing at the school district and um, with the Digital Wellbeing Task Force that Jack uh, has introduced me to. Uh, we've had conversations uh, because in the future, I think that we're gonna need to have ongoing conversations um, in a time where students are only getting their social interactions through social media uh, and it's so very limited. So I look forward to the questions uh, that you all pose and it also look forward to hearing my colleagues and uh, the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Elaine, for setting the stage and pointing out how digital and social media has really impacted mental health, particularly in the last couple of years since COVID. So thank you, Elaine. I know you're doing great work for all of the kids in all the schools. So Dan, Dr. Friedman, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing and what brings you to the discussion today. Thank you, Charlene. And thank you to my fellow panelists. I'm so grateful to be a part of this really important um, discussion. Um, I think as everyone has already sort of pointed out, really, uh, something that was important prior to the pandemic and has clearly become only more relevant, more urgent as we have been dealing with this um, pandemic for the last year. So I began my um, journey in mental health at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. It feels like a lifetime ago now. Actually, uh, in a research lab using technology to study a caregiver infant attachment, we would record videos and um, analyze those videos frame by frame to see that connection. But as I have uh, gone through my training at whew, community mental health centers and schools, hospitals, or right, on medical units and inpatient units, and now at Kaiser for the last year and a half, um, screen use, digital media use has been an ongoing concern. Right, and, then, and an ongoing source of conflict between parents and kids uh, without question. So um, that, that has been consistent over the last several years. At Kaiser, I, um, I co-lead one of our parenting skills classes for uh, parents of kids ages six through 10. I also uh, am the leader of our parent group for our teen depression group at Kaiser Redwood City. So um, helping to educate uh, parents of teens struggling with depression. And then I also participate in our teen intensive outpatient program for our teens who are having um, higher risk, right? Suicidal ideation or possibly suicidal attempts um, or self-harm. So kind of the gamut of, of issues. And certainly what I'm seeing, and this is not based on data or anything, this is just in my own practice that I observe, is just an a, a definite uptick in that need over the course of the pandemic. I think things kind of went into a lull when the pandemic started, right? And to some extent, I think 
things kind of settled down, people weren't coming in as much, and things have just steadily increased and increased. And um, there is absolutely a real surge in um, a need for mental health services. I, I know for adults as well, but certainly for kids and teens. So we're seeing a lot of behavioral issues with the younger kids, parents. You know, to some extent, I think parents are seeing things that they never saw before now that their kids are at home. Um, but also definitely just observing that um, kids are struggling with at-home school, parents are struggling to help their kids do their at-home school. Um, and that's true for younger children, that's true for teens, We're seeing an increase in depression. I think even our introverts who were maybe doing pretty well at the start of the pandemic have started to get some fatigue from it um, at this point too. So um, definitely a timely panel right now and I'm very glad to, to be a part of it and eager to hear questions and, and interact with um, everyone here. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. We really appreciate your expertise and all the great work you're doing for children and teens in our community. Thank you. All right, Jamie, we would like to hear from you and Common Sense Media, who's really been, you know, kind of the, the guiding star for so many parents during this pandemic with regard to digital media. So tell us what you're seeing and a little bit about your role at the organization. Absolutely. Thank you, Charlene. Really appreciate the time and space. Uh, Dan, Elaine, Jack, thank you for being part of the, this panel this evening. I, in all the 143 plus that are, that are here, I would probably mention your name in person, but it would probably take all evening. So let me just validate and infirm your presence here. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've spent probably about 17 years now, going on 18 years, thinking about what it means for our kids to be in online spaces. So similar to Elaine, I taught in high school um, way back when, and I saw early on that our kids were navigating this online space and really finding meaning in the connections that they were making. And then I started to realize that there was consequences to that. So we saw in the early 2010 or so, the increase in cyberbullying issues. So I left the classroom, I became an administrator trying to mitigate some of those issues um, social issues that were going on with the kids. Realized that that wasn't the form for me in an academic setting. And so I went and I became an academic director at a boys and girls club, thinking that I can bring um, local uh, community agencies and schools together. And what I've realized throughout that time and what I think what's consistent in my time, yeah, even as I've gone on to, to common sense, uh, is the idea that we need to validate our kids' presence online because it's not going away. Um, two is we need to support our families to understand what that bridge looks like, right? That we can't sort of shy away from those conversations. And third, we need to set those parameters and be extremely clear about the parameters that we want to set with our kids. Um, notice that I didn't say we need to evolve with technology because the tech is not the issue. It's about how we navigate our experiences with technology. So over the last three years, I've spent uh, time supporting school districts across the Northern California and now uh, the Western half of the United States, uh, trying to understand what this concept of digital citizenship and digital wellness is. We support teachers like Jack, um, Sequoia, a number of districts around uh, Northern California in implementing our digital citizenship practice. I'm gonna share my screen and give you guys an overarching kind of view of what we do and, um, and let you know kind of what you can do as we think about the Q&A that we're about to embark on. I'm going to share my screen, sh showcase kind of what you all can do. So give me a second here as I navigate this space. I, I, I certainly wish I could uh, sing for you on this transition, but I can't. So, um, all right, uh, Elaine, you're the only one I see on my screen. Can you give me a verbal, I see your screen, Jamie? Okay, beautiful. All right, so here's what we're gonna do this evening. And I, I wanna encourage you all um, to speak up, to ask the questions, to be vulnerable during this time. We wanna create a practical guide for you all, which is what can you actually do to think about um, both what Dan was saying about the social and emotional health, as well as what Jack was saying about how educators are confronting it. Um, it for those of you that don't know Common Sense, we are the leading nonprofit. And for over 17 years, we've been supporting families across the country. Uh, in a number of ways, we rate and review media. So if you look at our site to navigate sort of what movie you're going to watch tomorrow night, um, we help to provide unbiased reviews of books and videos and apps. We support schools across the country. We have over a million 
educators on our site where we provide free lessons around digital citizenship and how kids can engage in online spaces. And then finally, we help families sort of bridge that learning, particularly around uh, distance learning. So late March, we uh, created a hub uh, repository of resources for families we, we refer to as wide open schools um, where families can go in and provide and get activities free resources uh, together with our partners uh, let me name sort of the elephant really quick so we can kind of move on from this it's really challenging so if you're drinking a glass of wine now or three um, just know that um, we're all joining you at some point it is very daunting and very um, exhausting to be a parent during this time as a parent of a six-year-old who refuses to spend more than 30 minutes on an online Zoom call, I can attest that it is uh, challenging. So um, pat yourself on the back for the, the amazing work that I perceive you all to be doing. Let me kind of also invite you to entertain a different narrative. So if the narrative that you've been telling yourself and others is that there's a direct engagement between your child and his or her own teacher, I'm gonna ask you to rethink that narrative because our kids, particularly our adolescents, are very much uh, strung along in this social and digital space. The first is that we know that our kids are consumed by the time that they're spending online. We know that they're distracted by not only the video games, but all the social interactions that they might have. And it could vary from TikTok to Instagram to what their friends uh, said in their last uh, text message. But the idea is pretty consistent. Our kids are pretty, uh, very much distracted. We all are, but I, I wanna point out our kids. And finally, we all have a need to be away from tech. Our kids do this, uh, are having the same sort of feel, which is we, we wanna be outside away from the online space. But I'm gonna ask you to think about an opportunity that we have, which is how can we leverage the power of not only technology, but the spaces that our kids are in to amplify the positive space, the positive contributions our kids make online. What would that look like? So if I looked at Dan this evening and Dan said, you know, Jamie, I'm I'm an influencer on TikTok, and what I promote is really positive things online, and I give really good, kind feedback and kind tips for all my peers, then I would say, Dan, it's not important for you that you spend X amount of time. It's important for me to to highlight what you've done online. So I wanna encourage you all to think about the opportunity that's in front of us. Um, I wanna kind of highlight two studies that we've done recently that can kind of showcase really the, the temperature, the climate of what our kids are uh, in front of. I think Dan and as well as Elaine pointed to um, some of the trends that they're seeing locally. This is some of the work we're seeing nationally. The first is uh, a study that a census report that common sense did in the winter last year. And what we found early on is that, you know, and again, you might be thinking that th this is what I'm seeing every day, um, but our kids zero to eight are looking for entertainment, whereas opposed where years before they're looking for learning content, we're seeing kids uh, exposed to more entertainment, right? So there are kids from an early on, from an early stage are already exposed to um, unboxing experiences, things where they might not be developmentally appropriate for that particular child. As our kids get older, what we started to see from a, another report that we've done around teens and tweens and mental health is that our adolescents were seeking and increasingly going on online to seek information related to mental health. So we know that there's a fatigue associated to it, right? That we know that as our kids get older, there might not be those outlets as, um, as explicit for them to kind of uh, understand and engage with. And what ends up happening is you see this play out in, in a very interesting way. And this is a uh, report that came out at the end of November by a company called Ypulse, it's a marketing firm. But you'll see that uh, across the board are millennials, which they uh, term 13 to 39. I just missed that mark, who knows, but, um, but the idea here is that our kids, when they have outlets, that they're likely seeking comedy and entertainment as a way to mitigate some of those stressors that they're going on, right? Why is that a problem? Why is that a space for us to be cautious about? Because when our kids then entertain um, or think that they can feel like they're being entertained in online spaces, that often prohibits them from actually learning. And you can kind of see this, and I'll close this study with um, our kids' ability to maintain a focus for any given task. There's a correlation here, right? That if I'm gonna be entertained or if I'm gonna be going to Instagram or TikTok, my attention, my attention span 
severely uh, is limited by what's in front of me. And so when a, when a high school teacher is presenting content that's an hour and a half long, and you wonder why your kids are having multiple tabs online, we start to kind of address this kind of connection here, right? Which is we have a really difficult time of maintaining focus when something in front of us is based on entertainment or comedy, right? I would sort of ask you to the same thing. If you are um, in online meetings and at some point you kind of get tired of listening to the person, maybe you're already tired of listening to me, how many other tabs that you have open for any given um, meeting that you might have. So we wanna be uh, mindful of where our kids are at. So I wanna highlight this because I think this is a great um, a starting point for the Q&A that we have. What can you actually do? We're all gonna provide you tips this evening. I wanna give you kind of some high level things that you can do, some really practical things you can do after this call. The first thing I need you to do is I need you to affirm your child's presence, right? I don't need you to say, I really am proud of you. Be really specific about what they did online this evening or this afternoon or this morning that really that you appreciate. Right, so I might say if Charlene was my daughter, Charlene, you know, I really appreciate the fact that when you spoke up today, that I really enjoyed your voice. For whatever reason, you just had a voice that uh, made everyone feel welcome. Right, these are some really positive things that you can um, do to affirm your child in this space. The second thing I'm gonna encourage us to think about as we um, engage in this Q&A is to think about what scripts are that you're creating for your family. Right, I wanna be extremely explicit and share be really clear about the transitions that you set with your child. We all know that our kids are spending an exuberant amount of time online, but do we know how they're navigating to and from these places, right? So if I say to Jack, Jack, after you're done posting on TikTok, I need you to then report back to me what you said because I wanna have a conversation with you, right? These are some really simple sentence starters that we can have with our kids. And then finally, what, they, what it means to actually interrupt the engagement, right? Um, when I was a child, my mom would often never be in the room. She'd always be cooking, but she'd always ask me what was happening on television. And I'd have to curate and narrate sort of what was happening. But that helped me in retrospect, helped me to have a better relationship with my mom because she wanted to be a part of that process. I'm going to encourage you to think about how you can do that when your son or daughter is playing games or when they're in front of the device. What does that look like in your particular family? And then finally, I'm gonna encourage you all to think about what social and emotional online parameters mean. So this is a really loaded term and loaded concept, but the idea is fairly simple. Uh, physically, is your child taking breaks to do something physically active, right? If not, I'm gonna encourage you to increase that cadence um, or increase those exposures to do that. Um, is your child actually taking a break from the screen itself by actually uh, looking away from the screen? encourage that, have that conversation with your child's teacher if that actually isn't already happening. And then finally around hydration, we wanna ensure that our kids know when to, when they, what, what to do when they are mentally stressed or when they actually need a break. Sometimes drinking a glass of water is just a great sort of outlet as that. So I, I can go on and on, but I wanna encourage you all as a, uh, as a sentence starter to think about these slides as a way to draw some conversations uh, with you. I'm gonna include the deck in case that I went too fast onto the um, chat if you all want to go through it. But again, I wish you all a beautiful evening and I look forward to hearing your questions. Well, thank you, Jamie. That was indeed a beautiful deck and some really, really great suggestions for parents. We're gonna come back to those over time because some of them are very novel and I don't think they're necessarily things that people have, have really are using. I did sign up, Jamie, what is it called? Is it open school? Uh, it's wide, it's, wide open school, yeah. Wide I, will, open school. I will add that to the chat as well. Yeah. I get the text messages every day and they're so fantastic. It doesn't really matter what age your kid is. I find them very, very useful. Okay, well, let's, let's get started here. Um, I have a few questions that have come in from parents earlier. And if you have questions, please do type them into the Q&A button. We really wanna hear from you. So send us some questions, okay? This is um, this one is for Jamie and Jack. We've been talking a lot tonight about digital well-being, And Jamie, you gave us a really nice definition or Jack, you gave us a nice definition. Why is that important? Why does that matter? Jamie, maybe I'll give you a break since you 
<laughs> have been rolling for a little while and then you can chime in. Um, I think it was 2011. It was actually the year that I took a break from teaching to enter into ed tech when um, Pew Research Survey of kids in tech showed for the first time that we eclipsed the 50% mark for smartphones with teens. And it was in that same year, and Dan, you, you probably are familiar with this. I, th I think it was 2011 when the leading cause of mortality for that same age group was no longer, well, the big, the big cause, the big group is accidents, right? But if you break the accidents down, it's always car accidents that were number one. And that was that same year, coincidentally, associatively, that depression became the leading cause of death. And then it has just continued to increase in percentage every year since then. And I know Jamie always cautions me, dude, this is not a peer reviewed double blind study. You can't draw that causality. And I don't, but I do draw the association. And so um, we were seeing this in the school. I, so I took a big break, right? I, from 2011 to 2018, I was not teaching kids in classrooms. So I didn't have the same direct contact with them. And when I came back, I was teaching a different population. It was a very different population. Anxiety is through the roof. Uh, kids, the, the kinds of plans and accommodations we have are all around depression and, uh, and mental illness. They're, it's much less uh, about the, the kid with ADHD, which was you know, 2000 to 2010, and now, now it's anxiety. Um, is it screen time? Can we make that direct, the direct relationship? I don't know, but there's a, I think there's enough other research going on to say that we have to be careful. We've got to be careful about how we use screens. We have to be careful about um, how much time we allow for, those, for that screen interaction. And then as we get more nuanced, and Jamie is so good at this, when kids are interacting, we have to appropriately validate when they're doing things that are uh, character building. And we have to appropriately steer away when they're doing things that are character destroying. That's my two cents. Spot on, Jack. I would say great question, first of all, um, audience member. Uh, the reason why it's important is because the, the digital space is where kids are engaging and developing kind of cues about how to engage in the world. And without appropriate, not only parameters, but without appropriate guidance about how to um, instill habits that can challenge sort of these experiences, that they might have, these stressors that they might have. Um, they are just in sort of this wild west um, space, right? So we want to be able to not only parent them, but we all we want to be able to guide our kids to be able to think critically about the spaces that they're in, to navigate those spaces responsibly. And as Jack pointed out, to not uh, to have agency, right? In the ideal sense, I want my six-year-old not just to be a passive consumer, but to be uh, able to transform the world. You know, I have high ambitions for my child, but to be able to use media to transform the things that she's passionate about. So this is sort of why, why I think it's important. Great question though. And thanks for the context, Jack. All right, thank you. Great, great answers, both of you gentlemen. All right, we're gonna turn a little bit towards the mental health aspect of this conversation. So this question is really for Elaine and Dan. Um, we know that at-home schooling has been hard on many teens and their parents. We got that, right, Jamie? But what is really happening with regard to mental health, do you think? What, what are you seeing right now? Either of you. I, um, I can start. And what we're seeing right now at the school sites is that um, there's this paradox. We have students who are really dependent on the screen and use it for everything. They navigate through the screens in all aspects of their lives. Um, and then we went into online learning and schooling. And one thing that I found interesting is the amount of students that had a hard time putting the camera on. Uh, if you go into um, schools and look at a classroom or peek over your um, son or daughter's um, shoulders, 
um, and see the amount of students, if it's not enforced, uh, who have their screens turned off because of the comfort level, that's telling. That's telling of the dependency, but not wanting to put themselves out there. And so I really found that interesting. Um, and as I had mentioned earlier, um, there's a high feeling of isolation at this point. And we are social beings. We are social animals. We need that interaction with others. And, um, you know, for safety reasons, they didn't have access to the coping mechanisms that they had before. So a lot of students who would participate in extracurricular activities, such as sports or the arts or music, no longer had access to that. And so they are now, they were now um, dependent on looking at things online where, as we know through the social dilemma, the like, or teen angst, and all of these um, documentaries and the research that's been done, the more time you spend on the screen, the increase of your mental, the he mental health needs increase. Um, and so we're in this dilemma now where during the pandemic, uh, we know the consequences of having too much screen time. We have that data. Uh, and we've seen the increase of anxiety and depression and mental health needs over the years as we grow dependent on um, social media. But this is their only access to the outside world. So Jamie gave some great ways to uh, address the, those use and uh, the use of and creating some boundaries, much needed boundaries. Um, so that's what we're seeing at the school sites. And um, I think there's going to be a lot more work to do uh, once we go through uh, and even when we return. Absolutely. Thank you, Elaine. Well said. Dan, do you have anything to add to that in terms of mental health impact right now? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, in terms of mental health impact of screen usage sort of broadly, not just during the pandemic, as everyone's saying, the, the research is pretty clear that there's an effect on mood, on self-esteem, on some other sort of mental health factors. But I do want to emphasize that what remains kind of up in the air is how much of an effect that is. So I, I think there's a lot of mixed research on that. And the latest sort of <clears throat> looking at the you know, analysis, looking at all the research that's been done over the years suggests that there's an effect, but it might be kind of small. It's a little unclear. So is it, you know, is, is more screen use um, bad for your mood? Is it going to increase the likelihood of depression? Probably. How much? That's not so sure. So sometimes I do feel like um, the anxiety that we as parents put on that is, is a little out of proportion to exactly what effect it's having. Now, that sort of overall, that's pre-COVID, <laughs> that research, right? In COVID, there's um, obviously a lot more screen usage going on, but also just in general, I think what we sort of anticipated at the start of the stay-at-home orders come true, which is we're asking people to kind of rehearse depression, right? Stay inside, um, don't go interact with other people, right? You know, you can sleep in late now because you don't have to get up early to get to school. And what's happening is that as we feared, people who were already maybe vulnerable for depression are kind of experiencing it again, or people who maybe didn't realize that they were vulnerable for it are now kind of experience, you know, it's kind of triggering the depression itself. So there's a lot of that, I think. Um, initially, there was actually, I sort of observed, this is just anecdotal, a decrease in some anxiety. I think a lot of um, the sort of socially anxious teens that I work with were kind of like, this is great. I don't have to go to school now and I'm feeling better. Obviously that's short lived, right? And as um, Elaine was pointing out, right? They, then they struggle with putting their camera on and eventually they have to go back to school. It's gonna be that much harder for having spent a year away so it's not as if that's a real um, positive effect. And even, as I was saying before, even with some of those introverts or socially anxious kids, at this point, it's been a year, the lack of social interaction has definitely um, taken its toll. And, and then that's where I see the big conflict because I also see parents who are, you know, not incorrectly, extremely concerned about their kids' um, 
screen time, but um, the kids are getting all their social interaction through the video game chat, right? Or other or social media. And we, if we just pull that away, as everyone's been saying, we're we're kind of taking away a lifeline for them right now. So, um, boy, yeah. that is really well said, Dan. Um, thank you so much. Great input. Okay, we have a lot of great questions coming in. So we're going to see how many we can get to in the time that we have left. Jamie, here's one for you. Love this question. Literally, questions for you. Jamie, can you please tell me that TikTok is only bad so I can justify banning it from my daughter's phone? <laughs> <laughs> TikTok is bad. Um, only bad. Oh, uh, I wish I were in the middle of that conversation. You, there wasn't enough pizza or sushi or something you could feed me to, to respond to that. Uh, let me give you a direct answer. I would say it's not the tool itself. It's about how your daughter is actually using that. And so if your daughter is, um, after this call, you're, you come to observe that your daughter, your daughter is passively scrolling through each of those videos and doing nothing but actually passively seeing that, then I would encourage you um, to check that which is what are we trying to actually do in platforms like TikTok? The inverse is also true, right? If your daughter is creating videos that support her friends, that support her well-being, that support a connection that she has with her peers, then I wouldn't validate that. I would simply say, to what extent is that action in um, uh, helping to support your social engagements, right? So we wanna have those conversation. Try to go, move beyond the tool to think about how the tool itself um, can help to leverage what your daughter is seeking in this case. I wish I could say it's bad. There's, I can probably give you an entire workshop of the things that I personally hate about TikTok, but I know it has worked wonders uh, for families and for kids. So I, will, I, um, I would encourage you to ask those questions and think about how your daughter is using it as an engagement um, or as a passive, um, a uh, place to, to waste time. So both of those, um, we need to create parameters around. I'm sorry, okay. I can't be more of a direct tell, but that's what I would say. <laughs> no, no, I thank you for that. Um, you know, one of the main goals of the Parent Education Series is to give parents the tools that they need to better communicate with their kids. And we tell people to go right after it. You know, it's really, it's really acceptable and preferable to say to your child or your daughter, what do you like about TikTok and why do you like it so much? Show me and let them be the one to teach you, right? Absolutely, Charlene. I'm gonna, um, for the sake of having too many emails, I'm gonna put my email address. If you want parents that ask that question, sentence starters or to help prep, do you need a thinking partner? Reach out to me and I'm happy to provide sort of um, just a space to listen to the frustrations, but more importantly, um, questions that you can consider asking your child. Um, okay, that's um, something that I know there's a lot of parents would love those conversation starters. Jack, this is a question for you, the teacher. Um, what is the current thinking about high schools and how they should handle cell phone distraction in class? Someday we'll be back in class, but still I know there is distraction as all the panelists have been talking about with those black screens. You don't really know as an educator what the kids are doing, do you? Mm -hmm. There are a wide variety of responses in high schools to the cell phone distraction. Um, and I would also uh, use a different phrase to describe it, the cell phone opportunity. I, I'm a teacher who has always integrated ed tech because I love the amount of feedback that I can give and get through technology in the classroom. So before kids had cell phones, I had these little remote response pads and I would ask I those. multiple choice questions and get, and then I could show a histogram and they could see where they were on the histogram anonymously. I love that. And then when uh, the first round of smartphones came out, I had my whole family give me all their old smartphones, which uh, I then wiped and then handed out to the kids in the classroom with a special Wi-Fi system. And then they could use that to type in actually text responses. So there's lots of fantastic things that can go with that interaction. Of course, now it's just exploded, right? We, the, the opportunities are insane because every single kid has one and they're connected in 10 million different ways. What are high schools doing? Uh, in our district, it's, it's largely laissez-faire for the time between classes. And so the policies 
are that the devices are to be off or, or at least silenced during class and put away unless your teacher specifically asks you to bring them out for an educational purpose. And then between classes, the kids can have them out. Uh, that was different than when I left. It was no devices on during the day. You put them in your backpack. And then what I've seen, because I've been all around the country and into uh, in other countries, is that the smaller the school, the tighter the restrictions. <laughs> so the, big, the bigger schools, it's too much to handle. It becomes the, the sole purpose of three or four adults in the building to manage cell phone infractions. And it just became a, a losing battle. So one of the things that we strive to accomplish, at least at the outset, this was in a lot of our discussions, was how do we advise as the Digital Wellbeing Task Force our high schools and middle schools to handle the cell phone issue? Because if we come, we believe that if we come at it with a unified voice and that we are all, we're research-based and what we decide to do, and we're all saying the same thing, and then we communicate to you, the parent community, what it is that we're doing and what we'd like you to do, then we've got it, then there's a better chance at, at winning that battle. Uh, San Mateo Union High School District, or San Mateo High School, I should say, specifically uh, began in 2019 with uh, Faraday pouches. So this is, you have a pouch, that doesn't allow a signal in or out, goes, the device goes into the pouch. I'm not sure whether theirs were locked with a, with a security, like the kind that, that does uh, keys on clothes at Bloomingdale's or something like that. Um, and they would lock them as on the way in and lock them on the way out because I know, I know there are schools across the country, largely private schools that are doing that same thing. But that's, that's, one, that's one direction to go with it. Uh, you could cut it open because a lot of the concerns kids will voice and parents will voice too is, God, heaven forbid, what if there's a school right. violence incident? Well, it's fabric. You can cut it open. You can rip it open if you had to. You could squeeze it through the edges if you're in an absolute necessity. Um, so that's one response. And then the other, of course, is what, where we are right now. And I think that where we will, where we hope to land in a year or two, perhaps of work, is somewhere in between with uh, research informed in our decision making and collaborative across the community from home and from school. Thank you, Jack. And I know this is also one of the reasons that Jack was really a proponent of this task force to look at digital citizenship and how schools can handle these controls in a way that actually works for the kids and the teachers, right? Um, Chuck Bosco, for example, assistant by principal at Woodside High School said to me, Almost all of the physical altercations, this was before COVID, the physical altercations at school were the result of text messages. So that permeates everything, right? I just thought that was really interesting. Okay, Jack, what you just said leads me to the next question here. And again, we're just, people are asking such good questions, try to get in what we can. Can you talk a little bit about parental controls? My husband and I have all kinds of controls on the kids' devices. We check their emails, we talk them over with them. Is there such a thing as being too strict? It's a tough question. Me again or someone else? I'm gonna let anybody take that parental controls. Jamie, is that something that you talk about at Common Sense Media? Dan, I see your name written all over that. Oh, do you start with you, name yeah. This one? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, the. I, I get this question from parents sometimes. I think what I really think about is um, this concept called good enough parenting that I cannot emphasize enough. It's extraordinarily important for all parents, give ourselves a break as well, right? Um, the idea of good enough parenting is if you imagine a parent who is a perfect parent, there is no such thing, but if you imagine a parent who is a perfect parent and gives their children everything they need, attends to their every need, right, immediately, that child never learns how to be themselves in the world. They will never separate and differentiate from their parent, right? So this hypothetical perfect parent that doesn't really exist is actually not good, right? That's not good, that's not good parenting. What we want is good enough parenting where you are giving enough support, but you're not being perfect so that your child learns how to fend for themselves because they can't depend on everything from their parent. And I think that that applies to some extent with this question of, how much are we controlling our kids' digital media usage? We want to be vigilant. We want to be having open conversations 
with our children about what they're consuming and how they're using social media in particular, because there definitely are risks and we want to make sure they're prepared for that. But if we don't give them room to make mistakes and to learn for themselves, then it's true. We're not going to give them the opportunity to um, develop their own person in the world and in the virtual world. It's a really good point, Dan, such a good point. Um, here's a question that I know a lot of parents have. It's kind of a loaded question. So here we go. Is there a recommended amount of screen time that's good for different age groups? This, I know this question is very hard to answer considering that school itself is also screen time at this point for most kids. Or is there some place, for example, on your website, Jamie, that parents can go to, or are these recommendations kind of moot during a pandemic? Anybody? Recommended screen time for different age groups. I recently looked in, well, a couple of years ago, I looked into this because I was doing a, a research contract for a, a group out of Chicago. Um, dealing with exactly this. And the American Association of Pediatrics has recommendations, right? And the if you wanted to distill it down to a single message, it's like two hours a day, ha ha, <laughs> right? Ha ha during COVID, two hours a day of screen time. Um, less for younger kids, less freedom for the, the younger you go, and, and then more freedom and choice at, as you get older. Uh, also, not all screen time is the same. So there's a Australian study that came out, I think in 2018, that looked at 4,000 kids ages 10 to 14, I think it was. And they were looking at mental health outcomes and also just affect surveys. And what they found was that uh, there was an improvement in affect when the kids were engaging educationally with the material in the screen, like if they were taking an online class. And if they were doing things like passively flipping through Instagram feeds, it eventually had the too much candy effect and they would have a decrease in affect. So I would say, you know, the American Association of Pediatrics, the Canadian Association of Pediatrics have basically the same recommendations. I like the Canadian ones better because they're a little bit more conservative and I'm a little bit more conservative on this front. Two hours of screen time that is not educational per day is the maximum recommended. But like anything, all kids are snowflakes. And we say in science that 50% of who you are is the environment and 50% is genetics because that's on average, but really it's probably five to 95% based on what your genetic, who you are and what you arrive on the planet with. So you have to know your own kids. And if you see them spending two hours a day and it's crushing their spirit, then find a way to encourage them to be more proactive and interactive and for you to participate with them. Because that's the, that's the other thing that is often stated is uh, parent participation. Absolutely. Elaine, did you want to add something before I ask a final question? Definitely. I, I just wanted to um, second that you have to differentiate why they're on the screen and to see whether or not it's impacting other areas of their life. So if you see that it's impacting your child's ability to do other extracurricular activities or even their sleep patterns. So trust me, your kids may be texting at night or going on to social media and it's preventing them to get, it, um, to get an adequate number of sleep, uh, hours of sleep. So I know if it's impacting other areas of our life, then I think that's something to look at. And as Jamie had mentioned in his introduction, like how do you create those boundaries? Um, and I think monitoring is very important. Good point. So our time is coming to an end, but I have one last question that I'm gonna to pose to each of you. And that is, and again, thank you everybody for all your wonderful questions. I wish we had another hour together. We should do this again to really answer everything. But what is one, tip or piece of advice you'd like to leave parents with tonight? Dan, I'm gonna start with you, then Elaine, then Jack, then Jamie. So one tip or piece of advice you want parents to know. So my number one tip is gonna seem really obvious. I know that the parents I work with uh, are get sick of me talking about it, right? Um, it is what behavior do you want to model for your kids, right? So, in, and I was thinking about that as Jack and Elaine 
we're talking about screen how much screen time and all those useful tips is also you have to think about what your screen time is what your screen usage is we know that too much screen time can affect your mood we know that having your phone in your bedroom makes your sleep worse just the presence of the phone in the room even if it's off right research shows that that makes it worse model the behavior for your kids that you want to see our children are wonderful little um hypocrite detectors and um if you are telling them you can't have your phone in your room because you're staying up texting but you have your phone in your room and you're on screen until you go to sleep they are not going to listen to you right you have to be able to model that behavior so that's the number one tip i have <laughs> oh that's a great piece of advice dr friedman elaine how about you i was going to say the same thing um but to add to that you know if i told you that there was a new drug out there and the students had access to it right and we knew that the symptoms and the consequences were sleeplessness anxiety depression we would watch that and really look at that and want to prevent our kids from having access to it and we know that some of the consequences of too much of this are just that um, with with screen time and so if we think in that lens of addiction um, you know, I think we have to look at modeling what good behavior is and giving them the tools uh, because there's no handbook out there. And, and so, um, you know, just really monitoring uh, how much access they have is important. So thanks, Dan, because I was going to say what you did. <laughs> it's still great advice, Elaine, and you said it really nicely. Great advice. Jack, what do you say? I, I say Dan took the number one. So if this is family feud, I'm going for the number two answer. Um, we have a practice, and this is particularly during COVID, I found it helpful. Uh, we, we, wherever we live, we always have a place that in the center of the home we call the Kiva, modeled after the Native American concept of the spiritual center of the house. Unfortunately, that's been debased a little bit because it's where all the devices get charged. Now. So the Kiva is where all the devices hang out. Our policy is that the kids should monitor their use, our own children, uh, 13 and 16. And if they want to use their phones while in the house, they have to do it in the Kiva. And you can the only way to be in the Kiva is to be standing. <laughs> so, so they could be there and they will be standing for 45 minutes with their headphones on, rocking out and texting their friends but they have to do it in the Kiva. So I think having a centralized place is where the devices, the, the, I'm, I'm talking about smartphones in particular, right? Computers aside, if you have a centralized place in a family area where they have to stay to be used, that could be helpful. Like the days when where there used to be just one computer. Remember that? Everybody had to share. <laughs> okay, Jamie, I'm gonna give you the last word here. Tip or piece of advice you most want parents to hear. Let me just uh, close by saying thank you, Charlene, again, and everyone else that's still with us this evening. Um, Dan, Elaine, Jack, it's been a pleasure to, to be with you this evening. All right, here, here it is, everyone. I, I'm gonna try to get somewhat granular now. Uh, number one is leave this call, go to your child's room if you have kids and affirm their presence. Don't not only give them a hug, but let them know why you care about them and start this trend this evening affirm what they're doing online that you like and that reinforce the values that you have as a family, right? If you don't know the values, set them up tonight while you're in the shower, whatever it is that you need to do, but set those standards for your child and affirm when they are doing that. Two, when, you're, when you think about balance, move beyond just time. My child is spending too much time or too much time on this device and think about what balance means uh, for your particular family. It might mean that your child is spending three hours editing a film um, that he or she is creating on TikTok, not that I like it, but anything, or it might mean that your child is spending an hour with their grandparents, but be able to explicitly explain what balance means for your family. And see, uh, and the most important thing I think of all of this is understand what agency means uh, for your family and your child. So your child is gonna do things that may not actually uh, connect with your family's values, your child that will likely disappoint you based on the decisions that they make. Know what resilience means, know how to pivot from those moments to ensure that your child actually knows what to do 
to develop those habits. It might mean something simple like breathe before you respond when someone has created a, uh, something that you don't like and you want to react to it as a text message. Or it might mean that you want to publish your work and highlight it so others within the family showcase that, right? Affirmations, balance, and agency. Think about that this evening. I think those are really beautiful last words, Jamie, and I appreciate everything you brought to the table tonight. Thank you, Elaine and Dan and Jack and Jamie. This has been magnificent. Um, for those of you who are online with us still, I wanna let you know that this event is being recorded. I know you're gonna wanna share it with a spouse or a partner or your sister. So it will be on YouTube on our video library. And we work with the media production team from Boys and Girls Club of the Community. So it's a really nice partnership with them there. So again, thank you everybody. Good night, stay safe, stay well. The panelists, I ask you to stay on for a few more minutes. Everybody else, if you would log out. Again, thank you for coming and we hope to see you again soon.